All right, here we go. We're going to be talking about uh, inverses of square, uh, x squared type of graphs today. Um, so those will make our square root functions. Um, so if you recall, we did a lot of uh, finding the inverse of functions in chapter one or topic one. So we're going to be continuing that idea today. Now, first of all, with a typical x squared graph, uh, when you go and do the inverse, this is what it's going to look like right here. Um, but if you go and look at it, we don't really call it an inverse function here because when you go and graph it, the original graph is uh, not a function right there because of the vertical line test. So then we kind of started talking about the horizontal line test of an original function would actually go and tell us if it's inverse is going to pass the vertical line test. And that's because all your x's and y's switch around. So today we're going to focus heavily on <clears throat> is taking an x squared graph and only looking at a piece of it. So we call this a restricted domain right here. So apparently we're only looking at an x squared graph right here where the x values are greater than or equal to zero. And if you only look at that piece of an x squared graph and then you do the inverse, the inverse will actually be a function here because this is for when all of the y values right here are actually greater than or equal to zero. So like your domains and your ranges switch out right there. And then that'll make where you only have one side, I guess, of that... Uh, square root graph right there. And then just to get a couple of the points here, you should notice here on a square root graph that your points, you have a point at 0, 0, and then 1, 1, because of the square root of 1, it's positive 1. Or if you go over here, you have a point here at 4, 2, that's because the square root of 4 is positive 2. So it's very similar to an x square graph. Obviously everything is on its side, but if you go out to 9, wherever that is, you know, kind of like way out here, then the square root of 9 would be up there at positive 3, a little bit off the graph there. So that's a little bit of that. <clears throat> so I think uh, first section here, we're just going to uh, practice um, getting your the, the inverses of your x squared graphs. So first of all, we write these typically with x and y, and then we're going to switch x and y. So that's x equals y squared. And then to get y by itself, because you're trying to get y by itself so you could regraph it, you're going to square root both sides. And then since our quadratic unit, we've been talking about doing plus or minus quite a bit. So when you square root both sides. So this will be y equals plus or minus square root of x. Um, some people will make you write it like this, f of x right there, or f inverse of x equals plus or minus the square root of x. It's one way to write it. I've seen other teachers do this. They'll say y inverse will equal plus or minus the square root of x. Uh, so those are two different ways that you can write it. Typically, I'll make my students write it with the function notation there. So that is that right there. Um, let's look at when you got some extra stuff with your x squared. So this one here, you can change this fx to y, and then switch your x and y. So x equals y squared plus 5. And then now we need to go get y by itself. So we'll subtract 5 from both sides. So that'll be x minus 5 equals y squared. And then we're going to square root both sides entirely. And that'll get us plus or minus square root of x minus 5. And then let's go put our proper notation back on it. f inverse. That's basically your old y right there. And then equals plus or minus square root of x minus 5. So sometimes we'll have a few extra steps there. Alright, look here at number 3. <clears throat> number 3, um, what we got here, I guess, minus 1. So change the fx to a y, and then we'll switch our x and y. Some people will just even skip that step there once they get comfortable with the inverses. Okay, and then we'll add 1 to both sides. So that would be x plus 1 equals, I guess, 4y squared. All right, after that, I guess we need to divide both sides by 4. You can write them as individual fractions, but I'm probably just going to leave it like this. x plus 1 over 4, and then I guess equals y squared. And then we will square root both sides. So make sure you put your plus or minus. Let's use a proper notation. F inverse of x equals plus or minus square root 
x plus 1 divided by 4. And that is going to be your answer right there. So nothing too incredibly new there. Um, you know, I guess just common things people forget. First of all, the notation. And second of all, when you're square rooting both sides, a lot of people forget the plus or minus. Okay. So let's talk about graphing the inverse here. So we are going to consider the function fx equals x squared. Write the inverse of the function. So we'll do that here. I guess we'll keep this the same color here. Um, so we'll go y, change to fx to y, and then we'll say x equals y squared, and then square root both sides. And then I guess that'll get us y equals plus or minus the square root of x. Or if you want to get your fancy notation, we can go f of x, or f inverse of x. There we go. All right. So then find the domain and range of the function and its inverse. So if you think about your domain of just x squared, the domain of that right there is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. But then the range is going to be from uh, 0 all the way up to infinity. If we think about the graph here of what that looks like, we've got a point there, 0, 0, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and then 2, 4, and negative 2, 4. So this would be that graph right there. So it goes left and right forever. That's why it's from negative infinity to infinity. And then the range, the lowest y value starts here at 0, and then it goes up forever. So then we'd say that goes up towards infinity. So once we do that, and we go and find our new function, our square root function, here's that. That means the domain and range of your square root function actually switches around. So we're going to write this out kind of like this right here. So fx equals plus or minus square root of x. The domain here now is going to be from 0 all the way to infinity. And then the range is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. So I just swapped out the domain and range. Okay. So then if we were to graph that, it would look like this. You still have a point at 0, 0. You still have a point at 1, 1. But then you'd have 4, 2. So basically, it's everything is on its side, and you're going to, you know, just graph it kind of like that right there. And if you're kind of having trouble getting all the points there, just remember if you square root 1, that gets you 1. And then if you square root 4, if you go 4 full units, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then square root that, you get 2. And that's typically how those square root graphs are going to look. So we graphed its inverse, and then with the restricted domain for the inverse, write the inverse equation here. So um, with the inverse right now, the blue graph right here, it's not a function because of the vertical line test here. So typically we'll restrict the domain and only do one piece of the graph, kind of like that right there. So we're going to say that that is with y values being greater than uh, 0, I guess. So only the y values above 0. So for the inverse function, if we want to actually make it a true function, we need to say f of negative x right here. This needs to be plus or minus the square root of x right there, except then we're going to say the y values, or I guess the, the new, yeah, I guess the range values here need to be from 0 all the way to infinity right there. And if we're looking at our old function, y equals x squared right here, if we're using this just that range piece right there where it's you know just the top half of the graph, we have to say that the domain right here needs to be from 0 to infinity. So we get that same graph right here. So I'm going to just erase this left half of the graph right there. And then those would be true inverse functions of each other. So basically what I'm trying to get in your head here is if we're going to talk about true inverse functions and functions meaning, you know, only one output per one input, then we only graph, you know, these two pieces here we graph.
that's that right there. So I think every other problem from here on, they're going to actually talk about using the restricted domains. Um, so this one here, consider this function right here, it's x squared plus 3. But then we're only going to graph domain values that are greater than 0. So we'll go up here to 3. Oh, whoops. If I can count correctly, we'll get there. Then you can get a couple of points, maybe one a little bit off the graph, kind of like this. Now, instead of doing all these ones here to the left, we're only doing domain values greater than or equal to zero. So basically, this right side of your graph right there. Okay, so there's that graph, and then now we're going to go find the inverse. So we'll switch x and y. Remember, that's y right there on the left side. And then we'll subtract 3 over. So that's x minus 3. And then we will square root both sides. So that would be plus or minus square root of negative 3 here. Now, since we have that restricted domain, we're, we're going to have a positive and a negative version of the graph here. But really, when we go and graph it, we only want the positive version of the graph. So really, the true inverse function here is going to be just that top part right there, just the the positive version. That's typically how it's going to be most of the times. So just like that right there. So that graph right there, we'll go and learn here eventually. I think tomorrow we kind of get real, you know, big into the transformations of, of functions here. But basically that minus three is going to move your graph, your square root graph to the right three. And then you should be able to get some points kind of like this right here. And remember, it should look like a reflection across the line y equals x. So if you kind of tilt your paper to the side, it should be a mirrored image across that line right there. It should be the same exact thing. And you can also go and uh, make a table here uh, to go get some points. A lot of people will do that right there. So if you go and like try to plug in 0, well, 0 minus 3 is negative 3, and the square root of negative 3 you can't do. So... Like, if you go and use your calculator, it'll tell you there's an error. So, um, the first number we can plug in is 3. If we plug in 3, 3 minus 3 is going to be 3, and, or I mean 0, and then the square root of 0 is 0. That's why you got a point over here at 3, comma 0. And then if you go plug in, I guess, 4, 4 minus uh, 3 up here is going to be 1, or, and then the square root of 1 is 1. And if you go and try and do 5, you're not going to get like a nice clean whole number. That'd be uh, 5 minus 3 would be 2, and then square root of 2 is just whatever decimal that is. So you want to look for numbers that make perfect squares when you plug them in. So I guess like the next perfect square would be something like we'd probably need like square root of 4 up there. So I think 7. If I go 7 minus 3, that would give me square root of 4, which is 2. So... That's how you get a couple of points, but really I just teach my students to kind of know the pattern. If you go over one and then you square root that, it goes up one. And then go for the next perfect square. If it goes over four, then you square root that, then it goes up two. And then that's your inverse function right there. Okay. So I think this next page here, we're going to do a couple of these work problems here. Um, we're going to go and find... I guess uh, your inverses of these real world problems. And remember when you're finding the inverse of a, of a real world type of problem, basically this means solve for the other variable. And I'd probably even write yourself this note. That's essentially what you're doing with inverse functions anyways. We just switch x and y so we can actually graph it and you know know what the points mean here but with these word problems we're essentially going to solve for the other variables so you got a function d equals 4.9 t squared represents the distance in meters that an object falls in t seconds due to earth's gravity on the inverse of the function how long in seconds does it take for the cliff diver shown to reach the water below right there so first of all find the inverse of the function so that's this equation right here. So, and then uh, from here, then we're uh, going to go and solve for the other variable. So we're going to divide by 4.9. And then 
After that, we're going to square root both sides. So we're going to say t equals, and then instead of putting plus or minus here, we're just going to keep this as square root of d and 4.9 right here. Because really, we can't have negative time, so I'm not going to worry about like this plus or minus right, right out here. And also, you can't really have negative distance unless you're going underwater, which is, I guess, possible. But we can't have negative time, so we're just going to look at the positive version right there. And then apparently we got the distance is 24. And now that we got that the distance is 24, we can actually go plug that right in for D right there. And the nice thing about finding the inverse first beforehand is if I plugged in four point, or what was it, uh, 24 into the D at the original equation, then I would have had to do a few algebraic steps to go and solve for it. So in this case here, I just got to go and plug it right in and I don't have to worry about like moving things left or right or doing this to both sides. You just straight up plug it in. So let's see here, it was 24. I'm gonna use my calculator on my phone. Divided by 4.9, that gets us about 4.897. And then we're gonna square root that answer. So I'll go ahead and write out the first step. So 4.89, let's go eight, I guess. And then I will square root that answer, and that gets us about 2.21 right there, seconds. And I guess they didn't tell us about any units there, so I'll just, I will go with that right there, 2.21 seconds right there. And that is using the inverse right there in a real world type of problem. Basically, it just makes, makes it to where you plug into the equation right away. So I guess uh, this next one here, you got the function d. Let's see here, I got that written over. Uh, I think that's supposed to be v squared right there. It looks like it got cut off there. But um, the function v squared divided by 19.6 relates to distance d in meters that an object has fallen to its velocity in meters per second. Find the inverse function. What is the velocity of a cliff diver in uh, meters per second as he enters the water? Uh, jumping off a cliff of 24 meters high. All right, so kind of another physics problem here, and I guess this is going to tell you, you know, what the true velocity when he gets to the water is going to be. So once again, we'll find the inverse by solving for the other variable. Okay, so um, I guess we need to multiply both sides here by this 19.6. So this would be 19.6 times d and then equals v squared, and then we'll square root both sides. And actually, I'm just gonna leave it like that. We really don't wanna clean up anything. We don't wanna do the square root of 19.6 because you really actually have to multiply it by d first, whatever that is. So we're just gonna call that our velocity right there. Once again, you don't put plus or minus in this case. You can't really have a negative velocity in this, way, in this case, so. Um, yeah, that'll be your function, and then I guess we're going to go and plug in our 24 meters in. 19.6 times 24. So let me use my calculator here real quick. <clears throat> so that gets us 470.4. So now I need to do the square root of 470.4, kind of like that. And when I square root that, that gives me 21.68, let's go 0.69. I mean, I guess that's in meters per second of velocity. And then there you go. So really it's just plugging into the formulas. I think most people would be pretty comfortable with that. And then typically you'll either want to square both sides or square root both sides to, you know, to find the inverse. So that is that. Now the last couple of problems here, pretty straightforward. We did a compositions of functions a couple of units ago, and if you need a recap on that, that's back in topic one, so you might need to uh, go and do that. But what we talked about is when we did composition of functions, um, when we did it and they were inverses of each other, you got x for both of them. So remember, a composition of function, it kind of looks like this. This is a notation, f of g of x, which means you take gx and you plug it into the f equation right there. Um, so this is like when you plug a function into another function. That's probably in plain words what it means. Plug a function into the other function. Uh, 
right? And then um, apparently if you do that, you're going to get X and that will show that these are truly inverses. If you don't get X, then they're not inverses of each other. Usually you want to do it both ways. You want to plug in, I guess in this case, I want to plug in FX into the GX equation and then we're going to take this GX and we're going to plug it into the FX equation. All right, and typically with these, these only work if you restrict the domain. So they're just going to be talking about that restricted domain in this case. So let's first of all do f of g of x, which means take gx and plug it into the x into the f equation. So we're going to take whatever this function is right here, and then we're going to plug that right into the um, x squared equation here. So we'll do that square root of x minus 7 and then squared and then plus 7 all right and then when you uh, square a square root that'll cancel out so then that'll just be x minus 7 and then we have this plus 7 on the outside right here and then obviously the negative 7 the plus 7 will cancel out so you get x right there and that's what we were trying to get okay and then now i guess we're going to go and do the other order here we're going to do g of f of x. Okay. So then if we do that, that's going to be your fx equation into the g equation. So and remember you plug this in right where x is. So I guess I'll put x squared plus 7. That'd be in for x right there. We have the minus 7 and then the square root. Okay, so before you can do anything, before you can do the square root and the square here, you actually can add those together, which will cancel out. And then you have the square root of x squared, which truly comes out to x right there. So that works out. So these are inverses of each other, and that's how you show it. So there you go. All right, let's do uh, one more. Here in this case, uh, just like this here, you got these two functions here. We're going to see if they're inverses of each other. So I guess I'll do f of g of x first, and then we'll do g of f of x. f of g of x takes g and plugs in for f. We're going to take that whole equation, plug it in right there, and see what we get. So that'll be square root of x plus 1, then minus 1 squared. So it's all of this stuff squared. So we can uh, add the positive 1 and negative 1 first. And then that's the square root of x, and then it's that stuff squared. And then when we do that, that just gets us x. So that one works out there. The, those are looking like they're going to be inverses. And usually we need to do it both ways. So I'm going to go ahead and do g of f of x. Okay, so that means f is going into g. So it means this stuff here is going to go into that equation right there. So you have the square root of all of this stuff, x minus 1 squared, and then you had that plus 1 outside. Now here, um, since we have the squared and the parentheses and all that stuff right there, we do the square and the square root first, which are un uh, they undo each other. So then you have x minus 1 and then plus 1 outside. Obviously the minus 1 plus 1 simplifies and then you get x right there. So those are going to be inverses of each other again. So. All right, last one here. Find the inverse of this function right here. Okay, and then is the inverse a function? So we'll get to that here in a second. So first of all, call that y. Okay, afterwards, we're going to switch x and y. And then to undo a square, we're going to square root both sides here. We actually do that first. So that's plus or minus x right there, and then equals y plus 4. And then after all of that, I guess we square root, or we already square rooted both sides, but um, I guess we minus 4. And just be really careful. If you're going to put that minus 4, you might want to make sure your square root's not very long. Because if you extend that square root, then we're assuming that's inside the radical, which is a totally different thing. Okay, so there's your graph right there. Now, is the inverse a function? Depends on if you restrict the domain, kind of like what we're talking about. If we go think about this graph right here, um, x plus 4 squared, that moved our graph to the left 4, and it was a parabola from there. So if we go and graph the inverse, 
it's going to look something kind of like this here with both sides. So we would need to go through and restrict a domain. So I would say no unless you restrict a domain. No unless you restrict a domain. All right, and as far as what domain values you need to restrict it to, well, if I want that graph to graph here, we usually want that right side of a graph right here. So I'm going to say the do that the domain, in this case, is only going to be this right-hand side of the graph. So that's going to be starting at, I guess, negative 4, and then going towards infinity right there, which means the range of your graph down here is going to be from negative 4 all the way to infinity. And that will make it to where then we truly have the inverse graph right there and not both pieces. And then it is truly a function right there. The big thing you got to write down there is you got to restrict the domain. So other than that, that is it here for the lesson.